it's uh, my distinct pleasure to introduce uh, Professor Stephen Guy, uh, our graphics visualization guru in computer science. Stephen uh, has a very distinguished career. Um, so he graduated with a PhD from uh, University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill in 2012. Uh, his uh, undergraduate degree was from University of Virginia in 2006. He's uh, an exceptional researcher, but also is an exceptional teacher, which is uh, the combinations we want to have. He has received uh, a very prestigious The Bowers Teaching Award. And today is going to talk about uh, human actions and how it can be used in social AI as part of a simulation approach. Stephen. Thank you. Thank you for that such nice introduction, Nikos. Uh, can everybody hear me okay? I'll take the silence as a yes. Yeah, that's, yes. Um, yes. Thank you. Uh, also, feel free. I'm okay if you want to interrupt and ask questions in the middle. Uh, I'm trying to follow chat. Um, uh, yeah, I'll do my best. I know if, if uh, anybody else sees that there's a question and uh, I miss it, just feel free to keep pinging me until I get to it. Uh, and if it's taking us too far off, I'm happy to come back and talk about it at the end. Um, as Nico said, uh, I wanted to talk about simulating human motions for social AI. My background really kind of uh, straddles uh, between kind of robotics and motion planning on one hand, and then graphics and visualization on the other side. And really the core of what I've been interested in is, you know, what's kind of intelligent uh, motion? How do things move intelligently? And that a lot, has a lot of applications to things like video games and has a lot of applications to things like robotics and even computer vision. So here at Minnesota, been here for about eight years, uh, where we look at things like modeling the world around us. Uh, in particular, I'm interested in modeling, simulating complex things. Um, you know, how people are moving by themselves, how people are moving with each other, how people are moving uh, as they kind of interact in different states and different emotions. And also maybe sometimes how things besides people are moving. Uh, in particular, there's a lot of interesting connections between motion planning for virtual characters and motion planning for robotic systems. And I'll try to cover a little bit of both today. Uh, I want to start by saying, you know, anything I talk about, anytime I say I, it's a huge, huge team of people. Um, there's uh, the students I have kind of starred here, Bilal, Nick, Dalton, and Bobby. Their work is some of the most focused uh, in what I'm planning and talking about today, along with external collaborators from uh, departments here of psychology, physics, uh, surgery, and uh, also from outside the university at Clemson in Conception. Um, so yeah, my lab photos don't look like that these days. They look a little bit more like this, but I'm sure everybody's lab photos look a little bit more like this these days. Um, so I mentioned you know, social AI. And what I mean by that is having robots and video games and, and virtual characters in VR where the agents trying to make decisions, trying to interact with us, understand us. They understand what we're trying to do and why we're trying to do it, ideally in a way that's actionable. Um, so I've kind of picked three areas from my research from the past few years to highlight some of these ideas. One is work that we, I've done on faces and understanding what we can learn from faces. Uh, the other one, the second thing is on motion and interactions. Uh, and then the last one, I really want to look at some examples where we've really focused on motion planning. How do we figure out for robots or for virtual characters exact routes to take or, or exact velocities or, or controls to take that allow us to be as goal-oriented and collision-free and coordinated as possible? So let me go ahead and start with the face work. Um, yeah, so the, you know, if you, you might not really think about facial expressions as a motion problem, but to me, right, when we first were kind of working with the surgeon, we introduced this problem, that's exactly the, the mindset we took was, how can we think about face movement, emotional expression as emotion? And, you know, the kind of approach we took 
was to look at the mouth. And in particular, the, the velocity and the positions and the trajectory of the corner of the mouth. And this was partly because, you know, it's a motion problem. How, do, how and where does the corner move? Uh, it also helps us to understand um, from the surgical side, the kinds of uh, surgeries that were possible often end up controlling the mouth movement, the mouth angle. Uh, and this really has to do with where and how your muscles and nerves are attached to your, I guess there, there, there's a, um, a muscle here that's attached to a nerve that's attached like to your skull. Um, and surgeons can adjust the, the kind of rate and timing that those things fire. And so, you know, I liked this project, well, one, because it's, you know, emotionally impactful working on improving smiles with surgeons, but it's also, I think, highlights most directly the connection between thinking about motion and thinking about what it means to people. Really, there's a, a direct emotional impact from watching a smile. So to kind of establish numerically this connection, we went to the state fair and performed a study where we had a computer avatar that would smile with different kinds of uh, angles of the different parts of its mouth. And then people at the state fair would rate uh, how effective the smile was, what kind of emotion they thought it was communicating, and you know some other aspects like was it genuine or pleasant. Uh, state fair is a great place to collect data because you can get lots and lots and lots of it. Um, the some of the key aspects here is that we were able to get lots of data from kind of all over the state of Minnesota. You can see at this map here, we have, um, you know, obviously around the Twin Cities. So we asked for zip codes and there's quite a few around the Twin Cities, uh, but we had people from Chicago, from the East Coast, a few from California, a few from Texas. It was really kind of a diverse population. Uh, normally when you do user studies, I'm sure anybody here has tried, you get a lot of 18 to 24 year old people enrolled in college. Uh, here we had you know, people, people with their parents. It was really some nice diverse uh, group, group of people. The, you know, this initial work, we kind of focused on establishing statistical connections between the, the shape or the motion of the face and what, how people assessed the smiles. Um, and what we found is that there's some sort of sweet spot, some, some balance of uh, how much teeth you're showing, uh, the angle that your smile is going at, that really made the smile most effective, most pleasant, most genuine. Uh, and what's nice for us as computer scientists, we don't have to stop at that statistical information. We can use it to make generative models that you know, create new smiles of target pleasantness or genuineness. Uh, we didn't try it, but I guess we could have targeted creepiness of smiles too, because once we have models, uh, if the models are parameterized, then we can make systems that optimize and target these models. So uh, on the right, we're showing some faces that have been optimized to express genuine smiles. Uh, you know, I don't wanna to dive too much into the, the smile study, but I wanted to highlight a couple of fun things. One, uh, we said this angle and extent had a sweet spot where, too much or too little of either was harmful. Uh, also dental show had a really interesting interaction with extent. If you showed your teeth, but didn't smile wide, it looks kind of, kind of weird, right? It was a kind of a, there's an interaction effect between the two. Uh, and there's also some cool timing asymmetries. So this was one of our highest rated smiles. So I'll, I'll play it again. And you can see a real, uh, there's a delay between when the left side of the smile starts and when the right side of the smile starts. Um, and that delay increased how much people appreciated the smiles, how much they thought it was genuine, um, right? Which is something that you see a lot in computer generated imagery. There, there's some uncanny valley effect where things being close to right, but not quite right, feel worse. And to me at least, perfectly symmetric smiles is one of these aspects that can be too right. Humans always have interesting blemishes and asymmetries to them. Um, you know, in many ways, being imperfect is, is very important in digital, uh, digital recreations and digital interactions. And I suspect there's, we're gonna see more and more work from the human robot interaction community that starts to explore some of these same challenges in making robots that feel more interesting and realistic to interact with. 
Uh, also, since I mentioned the smile work, uh, I, I wanted to point out, you know, a, a kind of unusual experience as a researcher is uh, to have the late night talk shows pick up our findings about the ne necessity of pleasant balance between uh, extents and teeth shown. Uh, so on a late night with Seth Meyers, uh, he, he specifically called out a research and uh, poked a little fun of us for suggesting that has anyone ever told you you have a pleasing balance of teeth shown is kind of a, a funny compliment to be giving. But I, I was proud that somehow, somewhere, so, some uh, intern or producer had saw our, our paper, so that was fun. Um, you know, there's lots of questions you can follow up and ask about what we can learn from, from, from smiles, or can we, how can we model them better? Uh, one of the things that really was a focus for us was the mouth, but that's one small part of the larger smile experience. And in general, it's kind of a, a large open question how to assess how people are feeling. What, what's the most important? Is it eyes? Uh, is it cheeks? Is it mouth? Is it some other facial aspects? Uh, and so we did some follow-up studies where we uh, recorded people's videos as they watched funny videos. Um, and so they, they watched, we had them do two kinds of things. One was watch funny videos. The other one was uh, we just asked them to smile like you're setting up for a family portrait. And uh, we can use neural networks to start building classifiers to distinguish between uh, normal smiles and um, uh, kind of voluntary smiles and spontaneous smiles. And we're actually able to have, you know, with a, a well-tuned LSTM, uh, almost 80% accuracy rate of distinguishing between spontaneous and volitional, just looking at the features of the mouth. So uh, it's pretty interesting how much information your mouth kind of gives away about whether or not you're doing it canned or you're doing it spontaneously. Uh, in this case, one of the most important features ends up being a spatial temporal feature. It's thinking about the speed at which the mouth of uh, the smile appears. Uh, smiles that happened very quickly were almost always kind of canned smiles or more like much more likely to be canned smiles. And when it took you a second to reach the smile, uh, it was more likely to be indicative of a natural reaction. Yeah, so, so you see here, 81% testing accuracy was ignoring the eye motion. If we tried to account for the eye motion, the testing accuracy actually went down. Um, so I would love the takeaway from this research to be, oh, the things we focused on, the mouths are what's most important. Um, but I think there's another hypothesis here that we haven't explored. Uh, in this work is maybe just tracking the mouth is easier than tracking the eyes. The data we gathered was from the built-in uh, like a webcam on a computer. So the, our ability to very carefully track how wide your eyes are open, where you're looking, some of the highly detailed eye features are harder to, cap to capture than mouth movement features. Um, so, uh, you know, I still think spatial temporal uh, mouth corners are the window to the soul as much as the eyes are, but there's more work to be done here. My main thing is that uh, I wanted to point out is that if we think about the movement, you know, both the position of how people move parts of their body, in this case, their face, and the speed at how they movement, move them, changes a lot how we think about them and how actors trying to understand people need to think about them. All right, so, for the rest of my talk, I'll, I'll focus more on motion. So let me pause for a second to ask if there's any questions about faces and expression before I move on. It's, it's very interesting. Um, it's a lot to take in, but it's very interesting for sure. Thank you. Um, so yeah, let, let me move kind of to the main event of uh, thinking about kind of path planning, right? Where people go and how they go. Oh. So the, the, I don't know how many people here have experienced different aspects or, or looked at different aspects of collision avoidance. Um, but so when we think about the movement of something like the corner of our lips, uh, we need to, um, you know, the motion can be analyzed 
on its own, just by itself. I, I move my lips how I move them to hopefully express the emotion I care about. Um, if we are moving around other people, even moving my body, we have to start thinking about constraints, right? My elbows, my arms, my shoulders can all only move certain ways. If we are moving around people, there's additional constraints on the people around us. And this really kind of starts highlighting collision avoidance as one of the most important aspects of multi-agent motion, of trying to understand how people move through their environment. The second other people are there, that's what dominates the, the motion. And this high level field has been studied since at least the 80s. And some of the seminal work that at least I'm familiar with that influenced my own research was a technique called Boyd's. And uh, the idea was to simulate flocks of birds or, or gazelles or other animals where you apply small forces to, to push agents, kind of like a, a, a physics simulation, or if you think about magnets or atoms, uh, in this case, it's a social force where when you get close to another person, it pushes you away. Um, so the original work on this area ended up having a couple of forces, one that pushed you away from your neighbor, one that kind of, and one that kinds of matches your velocity of the neighbor. So pushing away is important, so we just don't hit each other, but it ends up being not enough because if I'm kind of coming towards you and we push away, we can keep going more and more towards each other unless it's a very large pushing away force. So Boyd's instituted this extra strategy, which was match your neighbor's velocity. If you got close to somebody, on top of moving away from them, you kind of took a little bit of their velocity. And what this has the effect of is kind of, you know, it stops the collisions by helping you match their speed. And the strategy works really, really well for things like animal simulation, especially for flocks. Because we get the speed matching behavior, we keep some individuality and some sort of groupness of our motion. Um, and so this was famously used in The Lion King to help assist the artists in animating gazelles as they came down through the ravine. The same strategy doesn't work as well in humans. You know, the individuality of the motion is an important part of what makes humans' motion look like humans. Uh, so this is the same flocking technique, but applied on a group of people. And this kind of weird motion matching leaves a, a, almost a zombie-ish effect, right? We're back to this uncanny valley of missing out on some important aspect of human motion and making it look less realistic. Um, and really the, the main problem is this issue, this, this, this approach of slowly correcting your velocities to match your neighbors. Um, and so what I focused on during my PhD work was thinking about geometric ways to handle the same kind of challenge. Geometrically, what can we do to avoid collisions? And uh, honestly, I did a lot of different aspects of this, but the one that I think has kind of stood the most test of time was this technique called optimal reciprocal collision avoidance. And it was a collaboration between myself, my advisors, and uh, Jura Vandenberg. Um, where the question was, well, if you have two agents moving, these can be two animated characters or they can be two robots on a 2D plane, um, what are the mathematical conditions in order to guarantee that they won't be colliding? So if we think about um, their current positions, the, the main, you know, we, we have to model their extent. The main question is that their extents don't overlap. Um, so if we think about maybe drawing a circle around all our robots or a circle around all our virtual characters, and we just think about their 2D footprint, the avoid current collisions question becomes, is the distance between the center of my circle and the center of your circle, is that distance less than our, my radius plus your radius? If so, we're in collision and we need to, to fix that somehow. If not, if that distance is greater than the, dis the, the sum of the radii, then everything's fine. So that's kind of the basic idea. It's a geometric approach to collision detection. But we want collision avoidance. We don't just want to avoid our current collision. We want to not run into each other in the future. And there's kind of a long history of different ways of thinking about this, even geometrically. 
um, I, I saw some papers once from, I think the 1890s, talking about ships trying to approach each other. And if you think about not wanting to run into things, even in the 1890s, you can, people realize that this is kind of a conical problem. If, you know, somebody's in front of you and you want to go to the left of them or to the right of them, if that person's standing still, that'll avoid the collision. So anything in between these left and right extremes creates a cone. And as long as our velocities are inside that cone, we're eventually gonna, gonna run into that person. And if they're outside that cone, we're never gonna run into the person. And so the um, ORCA is a way of kind of geometrically codifying that in a fairly precise way. So if we think about our exact, our, our relative position, so we're at zero, zero, and the person we want to avoid is at kind of the relative distance between us. Well, the kind of span of that cone needs to reach is my radius plus their radius. So we take the two radiuses and that creates this kind of large circle. And now as long as our direction of travel is outside of that cone, right? If we go this way, for example, we won't run into them. So the, the, the kind of cone is called a collision cone. If we think about directions, if we think about velocities, if, if we think about this as a space of X and Y velocities, it's often called a velocity cone. So we need to choose a velocity outside the velocity cone. The, the main trick that we, we kind of tried to highlight in ORCA is if you have a current velocity, there's gonna be some smallest vector that moves you outside of that velocity cone. Um, so given, given that current velocity, uh, so this is a relative velocity here, here's the non-relative velocity. If we move that, if we move at least that vector, then we know we won't have a collision. Um, it it's, ends up being overly conservative, right? Because it's forbidding more velocity than we need to forbid, but it's okay to be overly conservative as long as we don't collide. Um, what's so nice about this reformulation is the idea of a minimum change in, in this direction of your velocity can become a linear constraint. We need to say our new velocity needs to be on this side of the linear constraint. If so, then we will have updated enough to avoid the collision. Um, and so we've kind of turned the question of collision cones and velocity obstacles to one of linear constraints on our velocities. And if we have multiple agents we're trying to avoid, this turns into multiple linear constraints. So here we have a red agents trying to get to this red goal. The green constraint is the velocities, it has to be on the above that to avoid, sorry, below that to avoid the green agent. And the blue constraint, so it has to be on the right of that to avoid the blue agent. Um, a couple other small but important details to get the actual line positions correct. One is that we don't actually move all the way out of the, the collision cone, all the way out of the velocity obstacle. We only do half the work. Does anybody have a guess why we only do half the work, why we only do half the movement? Because the other guy does the other half. Nikki in with the clutch answer. The other guy does the other half, right? We, we don't need to do everything. They're gonna do some of it. So uh, that's the one kind of key thing is uh, we do half of the update. Um, so the other thing that we need to do is account for their velocity. If they're not standing still, um, we're going to shift the cone based on the, or shift the line based on the relative, accounting for the relative velocities. So here's the result, it's collision free. Um, and this is great. It works very well for virtual agents and for real robots uh, in a variety of scenarios. Um, we'll talk a little bit later on about some of the concerns that come up when you have holonomic constraints on your robot. Uh, my little circles I'm drawing here, I can just move left, right, up, down, whatever directions I want. But if I have something like a, a Roomba, it, it's controlled by, by wheels. And so it can't just like translate left and right. It has to kind of turn on some sort of circular arcs. Uh, so what we end up doing in those cases is using the collision-free orca velocity as a guiding velocity 
and write a small controller that tries to quickly reach that guiding velocity. In practice, it works very well. The whole thing very, is very extensible. You can try to change the way the cones work to support different kinds of dynamics. So this was a, 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 an effort to overcome that holonomic limitation where we change the cones to reflect the fact that our robot, can, to, like a, a imaginary robot, that can only move forward a turn, very similar to a Roomba. And so we don't get those kind of very nice, perfect cones because as we, we try to target a velocity, we won't reach it exactly, right? It, it'll be kind of a little bit weird as we're ramping into that velocity. So it ends up twisting the cones a little bit and um, that's fine, right? You just work with these twisted cones that's slower to compute because you end up having to kind of um, linearly approximate this. So it adds some computations, but computers are so fast these days that all of this is super, super real time. And the technique can be extended to account for at least some kinds of holonomic constraints. Um, so, you know, I mentioned this was my PhD work. What we've done since then though, is really try to think about and overcome the limitations that are inherent in this geometric framework. So it's provably collision-free, but it has this kind of um, over avoidance. So this was a, an agent trying to move forward and two agents moving against it. And what happens is that uh, the kind of VO cones uh, end up restricting almost all of this agent's forward velocities. So uh, the collisions will be avoided, right? If we um, go to the end, eventually the other two agents move and give them just enough space. But the, the result isn't very anticipatory. It's not, if, if we were expecting humans to behave this way, we'd often be surprised. Uh, and the more resistance you're running into, the, the larger the um, uh, the larger the the issue this kind of geometric local optimization technique can cause us. So here's one agent running into a uh, a whole block of people coming at him. So the, the collision point is guarantees are maintained, but the motion is, I wouldn't call this realistic and anticipatory. Um, so ideally we want something between the two, right? That, that is thinking ahead and anticipatory like Orca is, but not quite so afraid of getting, of doing everything in its power to avoid collisions. And what we really focused on here was looking at, um, or what we really focused on since was looking at kind of data-driven approaches. I don't know how much I was influenced by moving to Minnesota where big data reigns king in a lot of places here, but I think it's a, an excellent technique for things like motion planning when we have so much to learn from humans. Um, optimal control has its place. Uh, you know, reinforcement learning-based approaches have their place and we'll discuss some of them later on. But really humans do this very well. And if you think about how many other things you do at the same time you're navigating, there's some evidence that humans do this very well while using an extremely simple strategy. So what we turn to is very large scale data sets of uh, how and when people walk. And we had, uh, uh, I, I can't remember the exact number, but tens of thousands of individual trajectories of people walking captured typically from above head cameras across a variety of scenarios. Uh, several were kind of natural outdoor settings on college campuses or um, just random streets. Uh, but a few, you can see some at the bottom here, were very dense experimental conditions where people were carefully tracked through, through bottlenecks or other kind of um, interesting dense scenarios. And using this large scale data set of crowd motion, we're able to build up again, just like we saw with the face paper, um, statistical models. Uh, so here there's kind of a, a key statistical relationship between uh, how close people are coming to colliding with each other as measured in seconds and how likely we are to see that behavior. 
And using these simple statistical models, we can just like the faces create a generative model where we build a program that kind of an algorithm that tries to optimize for the conditions that the statistics told us were, were accurate, were seen in the data. And by trying to get into the conditions we saw in the data, we for free get this nice collision avoidance behavior where agents naturally avoid each other, but at the same time do it in a fairly human way. Uh, we can see here there's this lane formation behavior where this kind of emergent flows into to efficient lanes. And on the top, we have this um, kind of two things. One is a bottlenecking. So if you tried to model this as a fluid flow problem, uh, what happens is actually the flow like spurts out. Uh, people bottleneck and you know the model that we derived bottlenecks. And there's also this kind of nice arching formation. And all these things just come naturally because in part, because our models were derived from human data. So uh, the statistics at the end of the day uh, at the time we were developing them, they felt complicated and unintuitive. Having worked on the model for several years now, uh, both in its development and trying to expand it in different directions, everything feels a lot more straightforward to me now. So I hope I can communicate it as straightforward, but definitely again, ask me questions if it's not coming across clearly. So there's lots of different ways to kind of statistically think about what's the relationship between two agents and um, the, the actions they might take. And one of the first things we looked at was thinking about the relationship between the acceleration. Um, so if we think about people as physical beings, we move by accelerating. Uh, so we tried to plot the relationship between how we accelerate and where people are standing next to us. Uh, the, one of the early hypotheses was maybe if people get close to you, then you accelerate a lot to move away from them. Uh, and it just, there's a lot of problems with that. One is estimating acceleration from data sets is extremely noisy. Already estimating velocities is pretty hard. Estimating accelerations compounds that noise. Uh, but also distances maybe don't end up being quite so important. Um, and, you know, each individual interaction is itself also noisy. You want statistics that we can easily and naturally aggregate over all of these interactions. Uh, thousands of trajectories, tens of thousands of trajectories, which, you know, depending on how you break up the time steps, becomes hundreds of thousands of little interaction decisions. So what we use to kind of move forward with statistical analysis is a, a tool from, uh, as far as I know, I learned about it from a statistical physics background, uh, which is something called a pair distribution analysis. And the idea here is uh, really was derived from like gas dynamics. Scientists were trying to understand how gas relates to pressure and other sort of macroscopic um, interactions or relationships. Uh, so what we looked at was how agents, um, how agents uh, relate to each other statistically. So if we think about, oh, let me turn off, I have two annotations going on. Oh no. Um, sorry. So if we think about distances that people uh, might have between each other, if they were just randomly distributed, what you might expect is some small distances, some medium distances, some large distances. Uh, and you can actually mathematically compute what the distance distribution of a random group of people would be, or a random group of particles might be. Uh, in practice, what we're going to observe is often something different from random. Uh, in this case, there's like a, a kind of cartoon example. There is a key difference. Uh, on the left, with random particles, we have large distances. And on the right, the large distances appear kind of at similar frequencies. On the left, we have medium distances. On the right, the medium distances appear at kind of similar frequencies. But on the left, there are some very small distances that appear in the random data set. And there's no corresponding small distances that appear in the observed distribution. And that's presumably because there's some force, some interaction that has a statistically suppressive effect that keeps that, that state from appearing. 
And this is captured in statistical physics as a pair distribution function. So if we gather the distribution of distances, there's gonna be a difference between a, an expected random distribution, which serves as our denominator, and the observed distribution, which serves as a numerator. So comparing the two, some distances appear about equally likely in the two. And so that's our large distances. And so that ratio is gonna be one, but some distances are much more likely in the observed distribution. So those will be larger than one. And some are much less likely and those will be smaller than one. And the ones that are less likely are the ones that are kind of forces that are, that are stopping from happening. So this is a likelihood plot. If we wanna turn this into an energy plot, it's kind of the inverse of this. Anything that's near zero means there's a high potential energy. It's, it's very strongly avoided and the forces are pushing us away from those high energy conditions. Um, for things that are one here, that means that there's no forces at all. It's basically random. So we look for a function that transfers our zeros to infinity and our ones to zeros. So it's like one over X or, or maybe one over log of X. You might expect something like that. The statistical physicists have looked into this issue for us, and at least in the case for uh, position-based forces, which this is not, but we're gonna kind of use that approximation. Um, they, there's a right answer that they've derived, which is if you know the statistical um, ratio function, the, the corresponding energy that'll give rise to that is some constant times one over this function, but times, times the log of one over this function. So when this is zero, it's infinitely, it has infinite energy, it's infinitely strongly avoided. And as this r, as this distance approaches, uh, or g of r approaches one, uh, you'll get one over one, which is one, and then the log of that is zero. So those have no force avoiding them. And this is exactly what we tried in our human data set, is we computed this pair distribution function. And uh, honestly, it ended up being really noisy. And, uh, the reason it's noisy, if you think about the x-axis as distance, the whole process kind of falls apart. Um, and that's because velocity plays a really important role. So if we look at the bucket where people are moving uh, kind of towards each other fairly quickly, so this the relative speed is greater than two meters per second, um, we see something that looks kind of like that statistical mechanics pair distribution function. It's very unlikely to see somebody half a meter away from you because you'll be colliding. Um, and it kind of approaches one once the distances get up to one or two meters. If we look at the cases where you're still on a collision course, but going a little bit slower, you see that there's already kind of a shift between the two curves. Uh, when people, uh, you know, you're a little bit less worried because they're walking a little bit slower. And this is a hint that by ignoring velocity, our model is missing out on a key signal. And we probably should have known that already, or hypothesized that already from what we saw with ORCA, right? The key thing there for allowing us to predict in the future and improve the behavior of voids was thinking about relative velocities. The data told us that even stronger, if you look at cases where you have very low relative velocities, uh, the line is just drastically different than for medium or high relative velocities. Uh, in fact, when this pair distribution function is above one, that means we're seeing this more than random. And what's happening here is when you're walking, you know, not really in collision with somebody and just kind of walking next to them, that's very likely to happen. Either you're following behind them or you might even be talking to them as part of a friend or a family group. Uh, and so all of this kind of behavior is just not just missed, it's actually actively avoided in the model. Um, so yeah, human interaction is, not well mediated by a distant space model. Um, and of course, right, so the, the velocity plays a key role here. And one way, there's lots of options, but one way to recover the, the role of velocity is rather than thinking about how close I am to you in terms of x, y positions, we can think about the time to collision, how close I am to you in time. So if I'm standing very close, but we're moving at the same speed, I'm infinitely far away in time. I'm not gonna collide. But if we're far away, but moving at each other, I might be very close in time. So we're gonna do the same kind of plot, but the x-axis is gonna be 
the time that we might collide with each other, the time until the collision, if we're on a collision course. If you're not on a collision course, we're going to assume that, there, that that time is infinity and that there's no energy and we're not worried about you. And what we see is that no matter how you slice up which velocities you worry about, or you did a similar thing where you might slice up which directions people are coming in from, it doesn't matter. We see the exact same pair distribution function regardless of other salient features. Uh, and what this really suggests is that time to collision is one of the most important features. As long as we can model the effective time to collision on your motion, we're modeling the key principal component of what goes into human decision making. Um, so, you know, we can, this was split up into um, different velocities for a single data set. Uh, this is a, the same graph, but we split it slightly differently. Uh, here we've taken all of the dense indoor environments and in the inset we took kind of the sparse outdoor environments. Uh, the other change is we've done that Boltzmann transformation. So we took one over and then took the log of that, which is why the graph got kind of flipped. So this is kind of a graph of the implied energy from our data sets. Uh, and you can see in the dense environment, the energies are bigger because you know, people don't like being in dense environments and it makes sense that we would infer larger energies from that. Um, and we can use these models to infer now the proper K for our Boltzmann law. Uh, so if you, uh, so this is a, a linear graph. This is the same thing on a log graph. And you can see both models fit uh, a log relationship. So the uh, so if it's a log, if it's a linear in a log plot, that means it's a power law relationship. Um, so here, as x is the time to collision, y is this energy, uh, and so the energy is proportional to the uh, you know the slope is negative two which means that if we undo that, the energy is proportional to tau to the negative two. Um, so this is the power law of kind of a statistical energy, right? It's not derived from cognitive science. It's not derived from optimal control. It's derived from observed statistics on human motion, comparing the, the resulting motion to what random positions would be with time as a function. We saw a linear plot in a log space which implies with a, a slope of negative two, uh, really was like negative 1.98 or something. It was real close to two, which was of course always nice to write the paper. Um, and so we get an energy that drops off uh, was an inverse square or t to the minus two with time to collision. So what this means is that if you're about to run into something and your time to collision is very small, the, the energy with which you avoid that blows up to infinity. If the time equation is large and you're not about to run into somebody, the energy is almost zero. You can ignore them. And uh, naturally in implementation, if the time equation is infinity, you're not in a collision course, the energy is also zero. So the function kind of smoothly extrapolates out to any time equation value. Uh, so these are energies, but we want to do simulations, uh, either for animation purposes, where we can make nice videos for movies, games, and VR, or for robotics purposes, for robots to understand crowds, or even for robots to use similar strategies to enhance avoidance between each other. Um, well, because we have this nice, simple analytical expression of an energy, we can derive a forced-based navigation technique by just taking the spatial derivative of this. Uh, so you can either take uh, the derivative of the energy with respect to your position and get a uh, acceleration, or you can take the derivative of the energy with respect to your velocity and uh, kind of get a numerical gradient. Both approaches in practice work very well. So let me go back. So if this is us, we're, we're a robot or we're a virtual agent, and this is um, an obstacle we're trying to avoid, this is a graph of all of the energies for each different velocity we might consider. So you can see when the energies are kind of outside that collision cone, outside of that velocity obstacle, uh, the energies are, are, are zero, right? There are, are there's no energy because we don't have any sort of collision. There's no, there's nothing to worry about. The energies are only positive inside the collision cone. Uh, and as your velocity gets bigger, as your the the that means the time to collision gets smaller. We're going to have a more urgent collision. Uh, the energy gets larger. When your velocity is pretty small, 
the energy itself is very small. So that means you're not going to quiet for the person for quite a while, so you don't need to worry a lot about it. So this is the energy, and if we take the spatial derivative, we'll get the forces, um, or the negative of the spatial derivative, the spatial gradient to get the forces. Um, the equation ends up looking a little bit ugly here for two reasons. One is uh, something I didn't tell you about, which is that um, we added an exponential smoothing term to the model just to kind of, um, at the time we thought it would ensure a little bit more stability and, and the long tails when the, the forces are very, the time to collision is very big, ends up in practice, in my experience, it works equally well without that exponential smoothing. Um, the other reason that the, the equation, so that's why this e to the minus tau shows up. The other reason why the equation gets kind of ugly is there's this chain rule, right? We take the derivative of this with respect to x, but now we have to take the derivative of tau with respect to x. And thinking about the time to collision ends up solving a quadratic equation. So, so this is essentially here, you can think about it like the derivative of the quadratic equation for, for finding out the time to collision. Um, it's just the chain rule. You know, or you don't have to derive it yourself. You can just plug it into a tool like Mathematica, uh, or you can read our paper and use our derivation or, or look at our source code. Um, the long and the short of it, though, is that it's analytical. You don't have to um, numerically approximate this gradient. You can exactly compute it for any current velocity and position of the agent. And so this is the resulting kind of flow lines that come out of that gradient. And you can see if my velocity is here, it means that you know where my mouse is, I'm going very quickly. I'm going to have a collision very soon. It's going to slow me down and kind of turn me. It's kind of pushing me out of this VO cone. And all of our velocities push us out of the VO cone towards the side that you're already on. So if you're already kind of passing somebody on the right, you'll keep passing them on the right and you'll slow down a little bit. Um, the only exception is if you're dead center with them. So then you just slow down. You don't pass left or right. So um, you know if two agents are exactly approaching, uh, they'll just both slow down and will pass. But in practice, that has like a probability zero of happening. And you can overcome that by adding a little bit of noise to each, um, to each agent in their sensing or in their actions. All right, so this is it. This is the, the whole technique for uh, data-driven collision avoidance. Uh, two forces, one is you take uh, this gradient force we've talked about that pushes you away from neighbors based off of the power law, one over time to collision squared. Um, and then there's another force that just pulls you gently towards your goal or harshly towards your goal, I guess, if you want very aggressive agents. Um, no reason to use just those two forces. You can add more and more to capture different kinds of behaviors or different things that might be appropriate for your simulations or for your robots. Um, if you're interested in this, the code's online. It's uh, We have both C++ and Python code fairly well documented um, to, to play around with. Uh, there are some cons that uh, I'll, I want to mention briefly, just because we've kind of explored overcoming them. Uh, the most interesting one, I think, is or one interesting one is that uh, numerically, this is a very stiff system, which means we need to use very small time steps as we're doing our integration. So Orca was really nice because it was this provable geometric collision freeness. You could use kind of arbitrarily large time steps. Here we need very small time steps to move through and be, uh, be nicely collision free. So uh, here's a resulting simulation and the whole process works uh, fairly well. This is a kind of an evacuation demo. Uh, there's a roadmap on top of this that kind of navigates people uh, to tell them what the, the global preferred velocity should be. Um, yeah, the, the kind of nice thing about this work is it was a little bit cross-disciplinary. It has impacts in robotics and in graphics, but also in just the study of simulating physical systems. So it was actually published in Physics Review Letter, which was a very interesting experience for reaching out to a new community. Code's really easy to write yourself. I have it on the pack of my business cards. It's really just a few hundred characters. Uh, most of it's a vector library. And then uh, the in red is to solve that quadratic equation and then uh, to take the derivative of it, it's not that bad. Um, and that's it. And it leads to some nice, um, yeah. Uh, I also have a little rasterizer there, but it leads to some nice collision avoidance behavior.
Um, the other thing I want to mention is that it's not just easy to implement, it's uh, pretty accurate. So here is kind of coloring by the difference between uh, the velocity predicted by the method and what was seen by a real human data set on this kind of dense train interaction. And so red is high error and green and blue is lower error. So using these kind of simple distance-based approaches similar to Boyd's, the predictions don't match very well what's observed in the data. When we switched to something like ORCA, it got more green, meaning our predictions were better. But this power law matches the humans the best of all. Um, and it's really kind of capturing real things about human data. Um, yeah, so if we compare to ORCA, we've lost that kind of hesitancy, um, which is, you know, makes it a, a more realistic, a better plausible model for simulating people. Uh, I mentioned the kind of two things about optimization. One is that we can get rid of this very small time step if we use an optimization-based integration scheme. Uh, there's a little bit of mathematical details. You have to, um, you can't have large cutoffs in your energy field. So we smooth those, literally just blurred to smooth them out. Um, and, you know, it just works. So now using an optimization-based integrator, we can really have time steps of a second. Agents are once a second updating their decisions. And it has basically the same net planning effect as updating every tenth of a second or even smaller. At some point, it starts slowing down, but fairly large time steps work very well, and even larger time steps are still stable. Uh, the other thing you can do, again, in kind of an optimization-based framework, is you can start accounting for um, uh, constraints in your dynamics. So here we're using an optimization integrator where we optimize with respect to the controls you have. So in this case, it's your angle and velocity. And uh, if we use uh, differential drive ORCA, uh, we see it reproduces some of the same kind of problems that ORCA saw of the kind of scared agent. But a differential drive TTC respects the dynamics of the agents through the optimizer, but avoids the guy being driven back. He stands his ground and he keeps going forward. Um, yeah, so this is just a simulation. So Nikos, I think I see only a few minutes left. Is it okay if I take about five more minutes to talk about global navigation? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Awesome. Uh, if people have to leave, I'm not going to be offended. But I did want to just mention a couple of interesting things that happen when there's more people around and they're not, you know, all kind of maybe necessarily working together. Um, so, so kind of two things. One is coordination, right? We saw this kind of problem of you know, how ORCA against coordination would be um, blocked. Well, TTC against coordination just punches through. It's better than being blocked, but it's still not perfect. Um, and TTC itself also in bi-directional flows can really suffer because you have two very smart groups of agents doing smart things, but they're not accounting for each other and they just kind of get stuck. Eventually it works out, but this isn't what we really want. Um, so different kind of high-level strategies have been applied for, for different ones here. Uh, one was a collaboration with uh, Julio Godoy, where we looked at modeling this problem as a bandit optimization problem, where agents are choosing their velocities um, in ways that minimize um, or that try to optimize the reward. Part of the reward was moving towards your goal in a way that ORC or TTC is going to be happy with. But part of your goal is just trying not to get in other people's ways is to making sure that your velocity isn't impeding on their velocities. And once we have this reward function, again, we can use optimization strategies. In this case, Julio used a uh, UCB-based optimizer to find velocities which uh, tried to maximize this reward. Uh, if you've used UCB, it has its own problem that it's sampling-based. So it leads to a lot of jittering, which, okay, the optimizer is okay, but for a path for a robot or a character, it's not very good. Uh, so Julio implemented a context-dependent optimizer where you kind of minimize the number of optimization steps you use. So it made your velocities a little smoother. Um, and so that's this context-dependent optimization on the right. And overall, it leads to smoother paths that are more realistic. And I think I would argue more human-like than either TTC or ARCA before it. Um, the same kind of technique like we saw can be again applied on real robots. Uh, this is the kind of sampling-based uh, politeness optimization. 
And uh, I should mention these black lines here are a virtual obstacle the robots can't pass. And they, they naturally coordinate. In this case, uh, they adopt a following behavior, move to the side and let the other robot come through to maximize the politeness of the situation. Uh, another way you can have coordination besides, you know, that was kind of a sampling based optimization. You can also enable communication. So here uh, was work with uh, Dalton Hildreth where we used a, a reinforcement learning strategy where we had a neural network for, for each agent. I guess it ends up being like a graph neural network where they share a hidden state over a graph that dynamically propagates. And this hidden state is essentially a communication strategy. And the communication was used through an, uh, as, as a, a nonlinear transform, the incoming communication got transformed to an offset of my velocity. So depending on what I would hear from my neighbors, my velocity would be offset left, right, up, or down. And we optimized this using a global reinforcement learning strategy. So each decision was local based on your own network and what you communicated was local based on your own network. But we used an offline large scale optimization to derive your own local policy. And so now, what you say to others and how you react can be done just locally, but this information can be propagated as you're navigating. So here is pure TTC, and on the right, we're seeing the, this kind of hidden communication channel uh, in green and red. And the communication lets the agents pass through more clearly. And uh, on that bottleneck example, without communication, TTC gets stuck. But by using this learned hidden channel from this kind of uh, the small neural network, the agents can naturally coordinate and avoid the bottlenecks that developed. Um, yeah, so the, the one other network thing I wanted to, to mention, let me just uh, skip through the sides, was there's also questions about global navigation. How do we get to our global long-term goals? And, um, you know, this just has the same theme that kind of optimal exact navigation doesn't end up looking very human. So if we try to have people in a, this, we did this in a virtual environment, we asked people to move from a start to a goal. One or two people took the optimal path. The other 19 in the study went in some suboptimal route. And the reason for this is because you don't have the full information when you're navigating, you're making local decisions. Um, and so what we did is we trained a neural network to predict a local to predict a global decision from local data, much like the communication work, but now it's for global navigation. Um, yeah, so uh, maybe I can talk afterwards or offline about the the kind of um, network structure. But the high level idea is that um, you kind of did a local representation of the scene with one network, and then a second network aggregated these local representations to make a prediction. So uh, without aggregation, if you just make a local prediction for global planning, it doesn't do very well. You kind of forget what you've seen in the past. Um, and so you, you think, oh, I can make it to the goal. I'll go up. And then you go down and then you go up and you forget what you've done. Um, if you aggregate past descriptors, you can remember what you've seen and uh, kind of learn not to backtrack. Um, so yes, yeah, so this is the aggregated version. And the, the network, as it builds up a history, starts making better predictions. Um, yeah, so yeah, yeah, we can get that. Let me just show the video real quick of, um, this is a, uh, let me audio. This is a, an agent who's trying to navigate to uh, a goal and it doesn't, he doesn't know exactly where he is. He knows the region and some uncertainty. And by using learned local features, uh, he can try to get to the goal and explore on his own and make mistakes. And you can start to think about, you know, learning more, not just optimal, but realistic navigation strategies. All right, so uh, let me go ahead and stop there. Um, I know I'm already over time, but ask if there's any questions. Oh, hold on, let me. Questions? Let me at least. Uh... Um, hi, I have a question. Oh, go, go ahead. 
Hey, Steven. Hey, um, Julio. <laughs> uh, yes, so you talked a few minutes ago about this local navigation problem, right? And in the last slides about this uh, global navigation, how to find the optimal path. Have you started looking at ways of how this uh, global optimal path changes when you have lots of agents like crowds producing congestion, for example? Have you looked at how to how uh, this optimal path changes? How the agents great, great question, right? Just to be said as understood it is um, we can predict local collision avoidance to avoid congestion. We predict it global collision avoid a uh, global navigation. Shouldn't we combine the two? Uh, that's a great idea. Once I tried to do um, uh, kind of planning where you estimate the velocity based on density. So kind of intuitively, you can imagine that the denser an environment is, the slower you have to move to get through there. And if you have some sensing of density, you can um, uh, try to avoid these routes because dense routes are likely to be slow routes. But the um, uh, I've never tried training. I think like an, a, a training-based approach or an optimization-based approach makes a lot more sense than what I had tried in the past, which was just kind of model and plan over it using like a, a path planner. I really like that idea though. Also, I liked the Godoy and all work that I presented, by the way. <laughs> um, Perhaps we can, we can talk offline about, about that. I, I love it. I really, I really think that's a nice idea. <laughs> uh, I saw in the chat, there was a question about motion forecasting. Yeah, so I didn't get a chance to, to mention it, but one of the things we looked at, um, let's see. Yeah, is uh, if you know what path a person's likely to take, that's very influential for a robot. So in this case, um, here we're thinking about, you know, maybe there's a person standing still here, or maybe this is a chair or some obstacle. As a robot navigating in this environment, one thing that we'd like to be able to leverage is, well, if I have a model of where this guy in the green shirt is going to walk, I, that's where I shouldn't be walking. Let me take um, actions that keep me out of places where I expect his position to be. And so we can just run our simulation forward. Uh, what we did in this work is we actually did perturbation. So we, we did an estimation of the person's state and we ran kind of a hundred different small perturbations and we run them all forward. And that gives us kind of evolving Gaussians of where we expect them to be. Uh, and it turns out Gaussians can sometimes not be good representations. So we used a mixture of Gaussians. Um, and what's nice about this is you can somehow start to make interesting, sophisticated predictions. So in this case, the obstacle has the effect of splitting the predictions. So you know the person will go left or right, but they'll never be behind this obstacle. So your robot actually doesn't need to slow down as it's moving forward. It can move forward at full speed until it gets to the obstacle. And hopefully at that point, the person will have decided to go left or right. Um, so yeah, we, we end up using a, um, a decomposition framework where we made a series of predictions, built a prediction tree out of them, and decomposed the, the trees into various branches. Um, and then we had a plan for each branch. And in as the robot moved forward, it would try to detect which branch it was in and choose the appropriate plan. And that ends up being better than just kind of planning over a straight Kalman filter. Um, I think there's lots of other, you know, this was just one idea explored in the direction you mentioned, Salim. I think there's a lot of other cool things to do. Is that the, is that the kind of thing you're asking about? Yeah, the other thing is um, in very dense crowds, the problem becomes even more challenging, right? If we need to think about footsteps and body placement um, or not, maybe you just go around the very dense crowd like we saw Julio's method do. Um, but if you want the robot to kind of push through density, I, I don't know, I think that's gonna be very challenging, but I think it's exciting to think about. Other questions? Thank you, Steven. Thank you. Thank you for coming to the talk. I really appreciate it giving a chance to come to this colloquium. Have a great weekend, everybody.